internal analysis, understanding what resources we have and how we can most effectively commit that to the uh, process in, in play. Looking at what's the role then of marketing and how can it actually fit in terms of dealing with the problem and all the information that we've now generated about that and uh, who else can I work with that's already doing something in this area to, to get reinforcement there. Who is the target audience in terms of identification and, and analysis? And then, and, and we look at that, of course, through that problem analysis, we see who are the particular segments we really need to focus on in terms of reducing the overall burden of harm. And then undertake market segmentation by relevant behavioural, demographic, so like age, gender, ge geographic location, or psychographic in terms of attitudinal or life, uh, lifestyle or type of uh, variables um, according to the nature of the issue to be addressed. And what I want to do now is just take you through an example um, where we, because once we, once we look at those particular sub-segments, then we've got to really understand from their perspective, the levels of knowledge, beliefs and perceptions, attitudes and values, salience priorities, and by that we mean, okay, they might think that uh, this, this issue that we're, that we're targeting is important, but how important is it compared to everything else that's going on in their life, and how can we make this more important in terms of their response? Efficacy and skills, do they have the ability to be able to do this, or what do we need to do to make them more confident, and of course their own behaviour. Um, this sort of little cartoon sort of captures what we try to do in that developmental research. So that um, Mary Blivet in Department 23A, the Surgeon General has determined that smoking is hazardous to your health specifically. And this is really where we try to get to in terms of developing an intervention. We want each member of that target audience to say, whoa, this is actually talking to me. This really is about me. And uh, that's when we actually get that degree of traction that we need. I'm not getting traction with my clicker. There we go. This is an example of a psychographic segmentation done with uh, young people, 15 to 24 year old in, uh, back in, uh, it was about uh, 2003. Now this was an example where, in terms of looking at illicit drug use, there's certainly a recognition that not all young people are at the same level of risk. We know that there are all sorts of different subgroups of young people, and in terms of their orientation to, to illicit drug use, there are lots of differences. So there was a, uh, an exercise here where a qualitative research exercise was put in place with 53 um, focus groups. Well, it's a, it was a big study nationally looking at young, starting off with young people aged 12 to 14 who'd never even had a, a cigarette or a taste of alcohol, all the way through the, if you like, the gradations of drug use up to 20 to 24 year old injecting drug users to get a very rich picture of their understanding of drugs and drug use. And, and on the basis of that, then, there was a, a large-scale quantitative study of uh, 1,520 um, uh, uh, young people, 15 to 24, uh, sorry, 18 to 20, 15, no, 15 to 24, where we were looking at then applying quantitative techniques of uh, factor analysis and cluster analysis to say, well, how can we identify subgroups within this process, within this group of young people? What we see here is that, <clears throat> I won't go through a great deal of detail, but that the groups at the top are relatively low drug users, the top two are very low drug use at all, but for different sorts of reasons. Our considered rejectors are basically young people who life's going along quite fine, really don't need to get involved with drugs, just not interested. Our ambivalent neutrals, also pretty, these are pretty extroverted type of young people down on, this, on that side. Uh, ambivalent neutrals, uh, they a bit take it or leave it, but still not use, just experimenting maybe, not using very much drugs at all. On the other side, much more introverted young people, our cocoon rejectors, not using very much drugs at all, but primarily because of, they don't want to get into trouble and they're concerned about um, what parents would think or authorities might think. Risk controllers, again, experimenting a bit, but not having very quite low use, but still quite, quite introverted. And then our last two groups down the bottom, our thrill seekers, are basically young people who are just out there to push life's boundaries. And they'd be the same people that uh, police would be targeting in terms of speeding and other sorts of risk-taking behaviours. And for this group, the idea of drugs, something like ecstasy, is quite an attractive type of option. It's a way of just sort of pushing those boundaries. But they wouldn't be using drugs like heroin, because this group is about getting, getting into life, getting, using drugs to get more uh, into the experience as such. Our reality swabbers on the other side are, are young people for whom life's just not going very well. And for them, being stoned is basically a better, feels better than being straight in terms of the, the situation that they find themselves in life. So for this group, this group literally um, owns the area of heroin use. 
because they, they're using their drug use is about getting out of it, not getting into it. And when we looked at this segmentation, this segmentation was based not on drug use, but on attitudes to drugs and attitudes to life. When you look here, I don't want to absorb all these numbers, but just down the bottom, our thrill seekers and reality swappers, in terms of share of consumption, compared to the other groups here, dramatically dominate. In fact, this group accounted for about 90% of recent drug use of that whole co cohort of, of young people. And when we looked at their um, level of risk, if you're offered cannabis or if you're offered ecstasy by a friend, would, what would you, you know, definitely say no, probably say no, uh, probably say yes, definitely say yes. So anyone who said anything other than definitely say no was classified as being at risk. And again, you see dramatic higher levels in our thrill seekers and, and reality swappers. So it predicted their, um, their, their drug use and their risk level um, strongly. What's the implications of that? Well, the, the reality is the response then to, to those three, uh, to those groups of young people shouldn't be the same. And I'll, I'll go, I'll go to the, the, uh, the implications of that a bit later to show what happens. In terms of the first four groups, all of whom were pretty low risk, for them, simply what you need to do is reinforce where they're already at and you reinforce, create a stronger barrier to initial trial or to continued trial. For our thrill seekers, for them it's about saying there are other ways to push life's boundaries rather than drug use. And for them, but you've got to do that in a credible sort of way through their eyes. And our reality swappers, for them it's about early intervention and support. It's about helping these people in, in, in their life. And keeping in mind that some of those people had never used any drugs at all yet in that, in that reality swapper cohort. It's just that, that they had the similar attitudinal um, profile to be on that same sort of trajectory. Having done that target audience analysis and felt we understand the target audience, we go through a stage of, of channel analysis, as I mentioned, to really understand what's the best way to reach and engage with them. We go into a stage of strategic planning, thinking of, uh, from what we know then, what, how do we formulate the marketing objective, the behavioural objectives, communication objectives, with that theoretical underpinning in information processing models and attitude and behaviour change? And then how do we actually use that framework of objectives to develop strategies, pre-test strategies, so that we know we're on track, not just that we, we like the strategy or we think it's got our right messages in it, but that it's effective in achieving those specific objectives. And it all, importantly, the framework of objectives here also provides the framework for process and outcome evaluation studies because it tells you what are the indicators that you should be measuring to look at performance against. So you could say, we're starting off. What is it, that, in terms of the marketing objective, what is it that we are trying to achieve? Maybe it's to reduce the level of domestic burglary in the, uh, for instance, in that UK example. We then need to decide who is it that we need to communicate with or engage with or through the range of interventions and what specifically do we need them to do? Social marketing is not about raising, just raising awareness. It's focusing on a behaviour. What specific behaviour do we need this target audience to do more of, less of or the same of in terms of the objectives that we set for the, for the campaign? Then what do we need to do in, in terms of awareness, attitudes, intentions amongst this target audience to increase the likelihood of achieving that behavioural objective? Now based on what we know about theory, what do we need to make them more aware of? What attitudes do we need to focus on? What intentions do we need to generate to increase the likelihood of achieving that behaviour change? And then how are we going to achieve those communication objectives? How are we going to express those ideas? Uh, what sort of appeals are we going to use? And we showed you different appeals earlier. And then how are we going to reach the target audience with our communication? How are we going to engage with them in this communication that we know we've pre-tested and we know is it going to be effective in terms of the objectives that we've set? And then, of course, our, in, our monitoring and evaluation is about measuring what level of exposure did we achieve? What sort of communication processing? How did people actually respond when they saw what we were communicating? Did we achieve, what degree do we achieve communication objectives that we've set? Do we, to what degree do we achieve then behavioural objectives that we've set? Um, what, what is now the incidence or prevalence of the key behaviour that we're focused on? And then what are, what are the gains, if you like, to both target audience individuals and the community at, at, uh, at large in terms of the influence of that intervention? Social marketing mix in terms of the strategy formulation. So what is it, again, that we're going to be offering? 
And is it something, if we were saying something like the reduced risk of becoming a burglary victim or a victim of violence, we've got to think clearly about what are the benefits that we can promote based on what we've learned from engaging with the target audience and their current attitudes and perspective that are going to be realistic in terms of promoting um, this behaviour. What are the price in terms of financial, physical, social and psychological costs of increasing or maintaining or decreasing the targeted behaviour? Uh, if it's the burglary one, you know, there's going to be some financial cost possibly of adding security devices. Are people going to be more diligent in, in uh, uh, locking up their, their houses? In terms of place, <clears throat> this is a poster from um, uh, a colleague some of you may know, Laurie Gabbitts in, uh, in Wellington, uh, sent over to me in terms of community safety in Wellington. This is a new campaign that they've got running there, Stick With Your Mates, Stay Safe in the City, and about not leaving people on their own. Um, both in terms of protection, whether they're intoxicated or even, I mean, just protection, using a demonic advice of tape sticking together there. But a place setting like that um, is very important in terms of where the behaviour can actually take place. You need to have strategies in place to um, ameliorate that risk. And, and finally, promotion. How are we going to uh, promote it through the range of different uh, strategies that, uh, that we have there? And, in, and importantly, that branding and positioning consideration. Who is this message coming from and how do we position the source of the, uh, of the message there? Or what credible source can we use to associate with the brand of the, the campaign that we're uh, communicating there that is already having high credibility with that audience? We then formulate the marketing plan and uh, management system based having set that, those objectives. So the formalised plan, synthesising that very significant body of information that we've now generated. And this is still in the planning process. We haven't actually done anything yet. We're still in the planning process here. Uh, and laying out a blueprint for action with clear responsibilities and roles, timelines and budgets. We then start to go through the process of developing strategies and materials through that formative research that I mentioned in terms of concept development and pre-testing. What are we testing against? Again, not just whether it's got our messages in it, but is the way we're, we're, we're talking about this, is the way we've uh, visually displayed this going to actually attract the attention of the audience that we are trying to engage? Do they understand? What, what is their level of understanding in terms of the communications embedded in that communication? What's the relevance? Is this something that they are feeling it's for them or it's for somebody else? Because if it's for somebody else, then we're not going to have any impact on, on that particular person. What are the strengths and weaknesses there? Are there any sensitive, controversial elements in there that we need to modify? Or you know, is, what, how can we play up on those sorts of things for publicity and PR um, strategies? <clears throat> 